Tadu Sandav Singh, Call of God, Chapter 20, The Martyrs of the Faith. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Quote, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Unquote. 1 John 3.16 Sadhu Sandar Singh is in the great succession of noble men who have climbed the steep ascent to heaven. And during his sojourns in Tibet, he has come across well-authenticated cases of the martyr dome of godly men who have preceded him in carrying the gospel message into that dark land. Strangely enough, the first of these martyrs came from the state of P-A-T-I-A-L-A, -A, where he himself was born. Kartar, K-A-R-T-A-R, -A -A Singh, was a sheikh, S-I-K-H, and the son of a rich Zamandar, Z-A-M-I-N-D-A-R. All the hopes of the family were centered in this boy, for there was no other sons to carry on the name. Like Sundar, he was brought up in the midst of luxury, and the preparations for his future were made by giving him the best education possible. Nothing was forgotten that could make his training complete for the fulfillment of his father's ambition for the boy. But in spite of the utter neglect of religion in his education, there grew up in his mind a desire after spiritual things which his secular training could not satisfy. He heard of Christianity, and little by little, got to understand its claims until a deep conviction of its truths laid hold on him. The more he studied it, the more he felt it supplied the craving of his own soul, until at last he saw but one path before him, and at the straight and narrow one. Qatar was now take, took the irrevocable step to declare himself a Christian, a fact that filled the heart of his people with dismay. Many attempts of various kinds were made to win him from persisting in this determination, but finding him not to be tempted by ordinary means, his father sent to him the beautiful girl who was his chosen wife. This poor girl came before him in all her tender promise of life and with tears besought him to desist from taking a step that would mean such terrible loss to her. Looking upon her misery, his heart was touched. Yet even in this last temptation, God gave him strength and with much tenderness he put the sweet Hindu child from him, declaring that his heart already belonged to Christ his Savior. The broken-hearted girl returned to her future father-in-law's house to tell him how useless had been her protest, since Qatar had said all his love had been given to another. Not long afterwards, Qatar was driven forth, homeless from his father's house. To enable him to buy food and clothes, he took up the work of a laborer, and discouraged and undiscouraged by his hard lot, bent his back to tasks such as his own father's servants would have despised. Very soon, however, Qatar began his mission to the people of his own country and went preaching among the towns and villages of P-A-T-I-E-L-A, where he trod the thorny and difficult path that was to prepare him for the harder future awaiting him. After preaching in many places in the Punjab, Qatar turned his steps towards the mountains that lay between him and the darkest Tibet. And after some weeks of weary journeying over rough country, he found himself in the land of his choice. The Buddhism of Tibet has no place for Christ, whose very name arouses the deepest feelings of hatred and opposition. No record remains that Qatar met with much personal kindness so that his message was accepted. But no thought of going back seems to have occurred to his mind. These people were without Christ and had need of him. And as Christ had given his life, so Qatar was prepared to sacrifice his life also, that at least his witness should be born and his love testified to, to before his persecutors. Although hearts were touched by the sight of this youth and the fears of his message, there was little courage to take his part. And it was only after his death that the fruit of his labors and testimonies came to light. Qatar saw, as our Savior did before him, that the thorny path could only end in one way. In spite of numerous uh, efforts to drive him out of the country, he continued his preaching in many places for some time. But eventually he was halted by the Lama of uh, Tsinghaam, T-S-I-N-G-H-A-M, in charge of unlawfully entering the country with intent to teach a foreign religion. The end he had looked forward to had come, and with undaunted courage he faced the inevitable trusting God to God 
to give him the necessary grace to witness to his faith to the end. As Sundar afterwards heard, Qatar heard his sentence without a quiver and with a firm step, turned away from the judgment seat to walk to the place of execution. On the way, he delivered his last message, urging on the crowd the necessity of seeking salvation through Jesus Christ. And one at least of those who heard his words remembered them, and through them found the Savior. Arriving at the place of execution, Qatar was stripped of all his clothes and was sewn up in a wet yank, Y-A-K, skin, which was then put out in the sun. A cruel mocking crowd stood about to witness his tortures, and as the skin shrank and tightened around him, they laughed to hear the bones cracking in the slow process of death. By his side on the ground lay the New Testament that had been his one and only comfort through the hard days that had followed his confession to his master. Unheeded it lay until on the third day, when Qatar knew the end was drawing on. He asked that his right hand might be set free for a moment. This was done probably more from curiosity than mercy. Collecting all his strength, Qatar wrote his last message in the flyleaf of the Testament in Persian characters. In Udar characters in, in English. Is this a deathbed where a Christian lies? Yes, but not his. Tis death itself that dies. Translation. From God I live besought, not once but a hundred thousand times, that to this friend again as oft I might return it. That love for him, K-H-A-S-R-A-W-A, -A -A, shall not be less than hers, the faithful Hindu wife, who on the burning P-Y-R-E draws to her heart the loved one and lays her life beside him. The life he gave to me was what I gave to him. True it is that though I did all, yet I, all I could not do. No cry of anguish escaped the brave lips, but as evening came on, Qatar gave thanks aloud to God for comfort in death and quietly passed away with the words, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Sadhu Sundar Singh found that Qatar's father was still alive, and upon his return to the plains, he sought out the old man, telling him the story of the death of his heroic son, and speaking of the great love of Christ that had borne him through. The old man listened with a softened heart, and Sundar had the joy of hearing him say, I too believe in him. Amongst the crowd that watched the passing of Qatar Singh was the chief secretary of the Lama of Teshingham, he noticed the little testament in which this hero of the cross had written his last message and taking it up, he carried it home and commenced to study it. With the memory still fresh in his mind of the words and conduct of a brave man, his heart was open to receive the message the book had for him. And in reading it there came new light and joy to him. For some time he pondered the wonderful things he now believed. But as the realization of them more and more filled his soul, he could no longer keep his secret and one day revealed to his master, the Lama, that he had given his heart to Jesus. The Lama then declared that he also must die. Pitilessly, he was judged and sentenced to the same death as Qatar. Laying in the wet yank skin in the sun was not cruel enough to teach the onlookers that this sort of thing, if persisted in, would add to the bitter punishment. So red-hot screws were thrust into his body to increase his agonies. As if his tormentors were weary of waiting for the inevitable end, he was then taken out of the skin, a rope was tied around his mutilated body, and he was dragged through the streets of the town, splinters of wood also being driven under the nails of his feet and hands. His body was then thrown onto a dust heap outside the town, and he was left for dead. Having satisfied their lust for revenge, his persecutors departed, and for long he lay unconscious. Very gradually the poor fellow came back to life, and little by little strength returned until he was able to crawl away. When he had recovered from his many wounds, great fear came upon the people to see him, whom they had left for dead alive and well again, and to this day no one dares to interfere with him. Superstitious dread of a supernatural power they believe him to possess prevents attempts to take his life. So that when um, Sadhu Sundar Singh heard from his lips the story of Qatar, he also heard how wondrously God enables this brave man to continue to preach Christ boldly among the people of Tibet. These and other histories, like them, Sadhu Siddhar Singh has himself gathered during his missionary journeys to the darkest Tibet and other regions where the light of the gospel has scarcely pierced. 
To the people of these benighted countries, his gentle heart turns with infinite longing and pity, and his burning zeal for Christ and desire to make him known convince him that there his appointed task lies. He says, This is the field which God hath given me to work in. I have heard his call to serve him in these hostile provinces. I am not afraid of the risk. I have to win the, I have to win the crown of martyrdom by laying down my life in these parts for him. That some thus thing may be used of God to bring gospel light to the people of these dark places is the prayer of those who know, love, and revere him. But none can pray without earnestly pleading with God to spare his wonderful life that rather by laborers more abundant than by the supreme sacrifice he may serve his master and his generation. And of chapter 20 had been read by Peter John Parisi's.